Uh, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, I welcome you to tonight's talk. Uh, my name is John O'Brien. I'm an assistant professor of social research and public policy here at NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce you all to Dr. Stefan Timmermans, professor of sociology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Timmermans is a renowned medical sociologist who uses ethnography as his primary method to investigate questions of medical technologies, health professions, death and dying, and population health. He's the author most recently of Postmortem, How Medical Examiners Explain Suspicious Deaths, Saving Babies, The Consequences of Newborn Genetic Screening, and Abductive Analysis, Theorizing Qualitative Research. His talk tonight will shed light on the social consequences of newborn genetic screening, a public health program mandated in the US and Canada and being adopted increasingly around the world. As with all of Dr. Timmerman's research, his work on this topic pushes us to carefully consider how advances in medicine and medical technology can impact society in unforeseen and sometimes complicated ways. I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that Dr. Timmermans was also my professor and mentor while I was a doctoral student at UCLA, and he continues to be a source of wisdom and advice to me as well as many others. He's known among a number of us for being unflagging in his support for rigorous research, having an unwavering commitment to the highest standards of social science, and having a pinpoint accuracy at identifying the crux of any issue. I give you Dr. Stefan Timmermans. Thank you very much. It's a tremendous pleasure and a great honor to be here. And I would like to thank um, NYU Abu Dhabi for their tremendous hospitality. Um, thank you also, John, for this introduction. John actually came up with a name for my graduate students, the students I had advise and mentor. Um, since my name is Timmermans, he calls them the Timmermaniacs. So he, is, that's, he, he brought that to the table as well, besides the many pleasures, of course, of working with him. So my talk today will be drawn from um, a book that I wrote with my co-author, Mara Buchbinder, on um, the expansion of newborn screening in the United States. And just to make sure that we're all on the same uh, page, I'm talking about screening infants after the baby is born. And this is quite a crucial difference because there's also lots of screening in the prenatal context. Um, but I'm talking about it. And so in the prenatal context, the question is, are you going to keep the baby or terminate uh, the pregnancy? Postnatally, once the baby is there, it's just like you have to live with the situation. So it's, this is an important part of, to just make sure that we're on the same page. And so we have been um, screening infants in the United States since about 1963, when um, Guthrie, the man you see there on the picture, introduced a screening program for a condition called phenylketonuria, or PKU. And in retrospect, this was probably the most ideal condition to build a screening program around, a population-based public health screening pro program around. Because if you can identify infants right at birth with um, PKU and you can um, change their diet, you may be able to offset mental retardation. And so in the 1960s, this had tremendous appeal. This is the time of um, concerns about institutionalization of uh, the mentally ill. And so the idea that you might be able to prevent mental retardation had tremendous appeal. But in, um, while implementing this program, actually over a lot of protest of the medical profession, there was a lot of unintended consequences that arose um, in um, screening a population. And these unintended consequences had to do with um, parts of the signs that hadn't been figured out before the screening program had been put into place. Like, if you put people on a special diet, how long should they be on there? Um, um, you know, should everyone be on a diet? And in retrospect, in the first historical accounts of this initial screening program, they characterized PKU screening as a kind of a mixed success. And due to this uh, retrospective um, assessment, there was a cautious expansion of the screening program, the newborn screening program um, in the United States. And this was exacerbated by the fact that newborn screening is a state responsibility. So every state of the US can decide for which conditions and how many conditions they screen. 
And so the, the, the sign here on the left bottom side is how the screening program actually works. So when a baby is born, you take a little um, a needle and you make a, a, a mark on the, on the heel and then you blot the blood on these um, um, round areas on the right of the, um, the, the, the card and then the card is sent to the lab and then the, the lab analyzes it for these conditions such as PKU. So by the year 2000 we have the following situation where every state in the United States is screening for PKU for congenital hypothyroidism and then for one more um, condition at least, but some states are screened for seven or more conditions. But where, whether you would be screened as a baby for eight conditions or for three conditions depended on where you were born. And so inevitably there were situations where some people would be born in the low number screening states, but if they had just been born in the neighboring state, they would have been picked up by the newborn screening program. And so this was a very infuriating situation for the newborn screening advocates. They characterized it as screening roulette. Um, also, in that, around that time period, a new technology came on the market, tandem mass spectrometry. And what you need to know for the purpose of my talk today is that with this machine, you can take one blood sample and actually screen for a whole bunch of metabolites in one go. Previously, if you wanted to add a condition to the screen, you would have to create a separate assay, but that would have been avoided with the adoption of these technologies. And so there was pressure to standardize the number of conditions people, babies would be screened for. And in 2005, in a very influential report, the American College of Medical Genetics, now Medical Genetics and Genomics, um, recommended that every state screens for 54 rare genetic conditions. And they were very successful in making this the standard for the country. The Marsh of Dime, um, a public advocacy organization, went basically state house by state house and lobbied for the passage and adoption of this recommended screening program. And in only a couple of years, almost every state screened for the full spectrum of recommended conditions by the ACMG, the American College of Medical Genetics. And currently, the default situation is that 4 million babies are screened for rare genetic conditions, 4 million babies born annually. And I just want to pause here for a second, because if you are familiar with the US healthcare system, you will know that this is a very exceptional situation. There's very little that is universally available for every person in the US. Um, it's only when you make it to 65 and Medicare kicks in that there are health services pretty much universally available. But there's very little for people younger than 65. And I want to come back to this at the end of my talk, talk about how rare it is that we have this universal um, screening program, firstly universal screening program um, in, the, in the US. So as John introduced me, I'm a social, sociologist, I'm a social scientist. So what's of interest to social scientists when we talk about something as medical as a public health screening program? So this kind of screening program is one of the places where the hype around genetic testing meets the reality. And the hype of genetic testing has been amplified on both sides. On the one hand, you have the current uh, head of NIH, Francis Collins, who has thought of genetic testing and genetic screening as the pathway to personalized medicine and who has invested a lot of um, energy and resources into um, um, the spread of genetic testing and screening. But on the other hand, you have social scientists who have been very suspicious of this focus on genetic testing and screening and have thought about it in terms like genetization. And the work that genetization does is that it draws attention to the opportunity cost of focusing on so closely on genetics and genetic testing. And the concern among social scientists is that if we focus too much on um, genetic testing, this might come at, at, at the expense of attention to more widespread um, social factors that might also have a lot to do with the spread of um, conditions. But in the last decade, both of these high positions, the one that see salvation in genetic testing and the other ones who are very concerned about it, they're sort of come back a little bit more to reality. And what we see in clinics and in the genetics literature by 
um, um, geneticists themselves and by social scientists is what we can call more of a routinization of genetic testing. Genetic testing is done in clinics for particular kind of conditions, but it's not the end all be all of um, diagnosis and definitely not of um, prognosis and definitely not of um, treatment. It's actually one element among many that is brought into, onto the um, situation of treating, managing health across the lifetime. Uh, and if there is anything like genetization, it's probably in the emergence of the quantity of genetic data that is available rather than it is qualitative difference that both the, the promoters and the um, uh, critics of genetic testing were afraid of. Um, we see this also in the study of genetic clinics where the subjective badness, the kind of condition you test for is much more important than the fact that the information itself is um, genetic. And clinicians have a very mixed attitude toward um, the use of genetics or the, or the adoption of genetic technologies. So this leads me, this literature leads me to um, a research question. And what I'm interested in here is in once this program of expanding newborn screening had been introduced, what are going to be the consequences for patients, for families, and for um, clinicians of dealing, managing these um, infants that are picked up by newborn screening. And I'm going to focus today my talk about, on three consequences. I want to talk about the creation of a new patient uh, population, which I will call the patients in waiting. I will also talk about how screening programs allow you to rethink the, the nature of disease. And then I'm going to come back to this bottom line question that drives um, um, uh, newborn screening, the question whether these technologies save babies or not. And just to give you a little bit of background information of my study, since it's very important if you hear me that you know what I'm basing this information on, this is based on an ethnographic project. And with that, I mean that I've been observing in clinics how families and um, clinicians um, convey the screening results and how they act on it. And so I, we have been doing this study for three years between um, 2008, 2011, um, 12, and in that period we uh, followed about 75 families and some of those families came to the clinic once, some of the families stayed in the clinic and we saw them 11 times over these three year periods. Um, we had some families refusing them because we, we um, audio taped them um, and so we have data about what happens in the clinic. Then we also follow up with these parents. We, we call them up we, or we go to their houses and we interview them to see, um, to get their side of the story and to see what they make of the information that they received in the clinic. We also follow up with the clinicians. We talk to them. We attend the staff meeting that happens um, after every um, clinic day where geneticists share their insights with each other and get feedback from, from each other. And then we also had access to medical records. And the population that we studied is a very diverse population, both socioeconomically and ethnically, since this was done in the Los Angeles area. We had people in our study who picked strawberries in the fields of Oxnard. We had people who drove these strawberries in trucks to the city. And then we had movie stars who ate those strawberries on the um, different sets that they were working at. So there's a very diverse population. Okay, so we're looking at the screening of babies and there are four possible outcomes of newborn screening. And this is based on a um, review study um, of um, the expansion of newborn screening between 2005 and 2009, where in California, 2,105,119 newborns were screened for these 54 conditions. California was one of the early adopter states of this uh, expanded newborn screening. In the overwhelming majority, 99.78%, the results are negative, which means in this case that you do not have one of these 54 conditions. That's the result you want. But in about 4,580 cases, the result was uh, positive. There were some of those were false positives, although it's very difficult to figure out from the statistics how many there were. But there were about 754 where there was absolutely no ambiguity that these infants had these conditions for which the screen was screening. And this either meant that they already developed symptoms or 
these were conditions that were so well studied and so well known that um, we didn't really, there was no ambiguity about it. But then there were also some ambiguous out of range results. And these are the ones that I will be talking about today. These are the patients um, in waiting. And the questions that clinicians and parents struggle with, with these patients in waiting is, does this newborn really have the disease that we are screening for? And even if he or she has the disease, what is this disease? There's a very fundamental questions that come to the forefront due to um, newborn screening. So let me start off by explaining you these patients in waiting. So to really make sure that we're all on the same page, I want to just make this very concrete for you. So imagine you have, um, you, you have given birth, you're a, new, you, you have given birth, you're a new parent of a newborn, and people enter that stage from very different areas of their life. Some people want to get pregnant, some people don't want to get pre pregnant, some people have difficulty conceiving, some people e conceive um, almost um, in, inadvertently, accidentally, but here you are, you are there with the baby. And then you have the baby has a positive newborn screen, and you're called into a clinic. And what the doctor tells you, and we heard the doctor say this pretty much the way I will quote this to you, is, and so remember, you're cradling your baby. The, ba the doctor looks at you and says, you, your baby has a positive newborn screen. It could mean that the baby is at risk for very serious issues, such as mental retardation or sudden death. It could also mean that it's nothing, and we don't know what it is. That is the dilemma of a being a patient in waiting. So a patient in waiting is um, suspended between disease and normalness. It's, some way, it's a baby that has test positive on the screen, but the value is not as serious or doesn't seem as serious as the babies that these doctors are familiar um, with. And so how do you become um, one of these uh, patients in waiting, and I, I refer, use this for both the parents and the newborns because they, they share the, for, the role of a uh, patient in waiting. So how do you get this kind of um, issue? It often begins already from the very first time the parents are being notified that their infant has a positive um, screen. And this, this, this is, comes to a shock to most of the parents because in the US, uh, informed consent is not required to do newborn screening. So you can opt out of it if you know about it, but it's not, you're not asked it. So you really need to know about the program to opt out of it. And so most people, it's just part of the hospital checkout procedures that there's a little bit of blood taken with a needle and um, it, you just need to go through it. And maybe they get some information. So when they're being called up by the newborn screening program, for many parents, that's the first moment they really become aware that their infant um, had been um, uh, tested and that it was positive. And so the, prog the, the program in its first phone conversation tries to reassure parents and they say, you know, it's likely that this is going to be a false positive, but at the same time they say, you need to retest today, stat, as one of the fathers in our study um, told us. And so um, when we talked to parents about how they reacted to this first phone conversation, um, families felt, and I'm reading here quotes from different interviews, devastated, surprised and shocked, freaked out, scared. They referred to the initial phone call as horrible, giving the new mom a heart attack. My nerves were shot, very nerve-wracking, didn't know um, what to think. And sometimes this first phone conversation also comes with some um, kind of preventive measures, like the parents are being told, you know, don't let your baby get unfed for two hours. Just make sure you, you keep feeding it for two hours um, until we know more about this condition. So these preventive measures also suggest a level of urgency. So what do most parents do when they hear uh, news like this? Well, what would you do? So you would go on your computer and you would Google. And so, because these are very rare conditions, most of what you will find online are very uh, bad stories. Those are the horror stories that um, are going to prevail. And so the, the parents then call up their pediatrician and ask, does he or she know anything more about these conditions? But pediatricians are usually no help because these are very rare conditions and they have never um, encountered them before. So this enhances the anxiety, as you can see here in an, a quote of a mom whose infant was um, 
picked up with, for PKU. So she says, actually the first time that they had suggested that he might have PKU, you go back to read the material and it's like a blur. Basically it says, we test for this, PKU is this, and basically in a nutshell, because of a deficiency in an enzyme, your child can become mentally retarded. So I'm like, what? And then you go on the internet and it's like, if the levels are like this, you know he'll become retarded. He's losing IQ points by the second. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm looking at him and like, he seems fine. Is his brain, you know, getting destroyed by the protein that's in my breast milk? So this is deeply um, upsetting information. And to further exacerbate the situation, the kind of information that the parents are being told and that they find online is that the symptoms that may indicate that something is awry with their baby are very vague. Like, not eating very much, but most babies are kind of picky at the beginning, or um, not sleeping through the night, or uh, sleeping too much, you know, both of those can suggest, or feeling floppy, like hypotonia, and having a little bit of a floppy baby. It's, they're not really clear indications. And for some of the conditions, what you will find online is that the first sign of disease is actually sudden death. So for one of the conditions that I will be talking a lot about, MCAT, this is one of these um, signs. So when the parents visit the metabolic clinic, they are extremely attentive. They are very much a captive audience that's looking for some kind of resolution. But as I already mentioned when I, when I talked to you about the kind of message that they get when they enter the clinic, these geneticists don't really um, have the, um, the, the, the resolution or the answers because these are very rare conditions that have been rarely encountered prior to the screening programs. So instead what the parents get, instead of reassurance, they get continued mixed messages. And I will illustrate this with a quote from my field notes where a um, stepmother in this case visits a geneticist for a condition called hyperprolinemia. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I read more than what's on the slides here. So in this visit, so you have the mom and the baby and the geneticist with the genetic counselor and we are sitting in the room as well. So when the geneticist talks to the foster mother, he states, oh yeah, this was a foster mother. He states, from my perspective, it's quite reassuring. First of all, proline levels are high, but they are not super high. He explains that hyperprolinemia comes in two variants. The first one is simply a biochemical finding. It's a random finding, no symptoms, nothing. He adds that if it were not for newborn screening, he would never have detected it. He qualifies that the difference between type one and type two does not depend on levels alone, but also on different genes. But unfortunately, they cannot test for these genes because these tests are not available on a clinical level. They're only available on a research basis. So the foster mother starts asking questions. She asks, when could symptoms appear? And the geneticist answers that they should show in the first year of life. And then when the foster mother presses the geneticist and asks, can they arrive later? The geneticist admits they could, we don't know. I can't guarantee anything. But the fact that she is developmentally perfectly on target is a good sign. So then the foster mother asks about warning signs besides seizures and the physicians explains that they should be attuned to regular development of landmarks such as sitting, walking, and bubbling in time. And the idea here is if, if the child doesn't walk, bubble, or sit in time, that might be a cause for concern. So what you see is that the mother does not receive clear answers to her questions that are very elementary, like what are the symptoms, when will they occur? And later at the um, staff meeting after the clinic, there's a debate between the geneticists that we witness where some of the geneticists actually wonder whether um, hyperprolinemia is a true disease, whether we should even be screening for that. So here you see that the question is not only what is the disease, but, uh, or does the child have the disease, but what does the disease um, stand for? What, does it what is it constituted? <laughs> so the course that we observed for these families is that they're going through a repetition of different kinds of tests. The metabolic tests are being repeated. Sometimes a genetic test is added if they're uh, um, available. But for patients in waiting, they keep hanging in limbo between disease and health, and there's not really a resolution 
of um, these test results. It doesn't conclusively say you're out of the woods or you're, you're, um, um, uh, you're, you're affected. And these parents live with um, these uncertainties and are trying to um, check developmental milestones. But what we also noted was that in the lives of these parents, the, they were asked to, do, to take preventive measures as if this was a real disease, even though it was still a bit inconclusive. So they were, for example, they received an emergency letter. And the emergency letter explained what kind of disorder this was. And if there was a crisis, they would have to take the, the emergency letter with them to the doctor um, in the emergency room and show it there so that they, know, they would know what to do. And so they were told to have a copy of this letter at all times with them. They were told sometimes to uh, feed their baby more regularly, to watch carefully for these developmental milestones, to call up at the first sight of um, concern. And there was also paperwork involved. So you cannot get an, an, an appointment in a hospital unless you have a diagnosis. So these tentative diagnoses, they became real diagnoses for, for billing purposes. So they took on a life um, of their own. And the fam family started to organize their lives as if the, 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 um, um, the diagnosis was real, even though there was a lot of uncertainty. And we see that in the same family that I discussed um, before this, with, with the foster mother and the hyperprolemia case. So this, this family came back six months later. And remember, this was a very tentative diagnosis. The doctor was trying to reassure them, uh, but also giving them you know, um, pointers on what to look for. And in the, in the meeting, there was a lot of debate of whether this was a real condition. So at the second visit, six months later, the foster mother reviews the developmental steps of her daughter in light of the possibility of hyperprolemia. This when telling about her daughter's difficulty transitioning to solid food, the mother adds, we were not sure whether it was simply a delay where it could soon happen, or there was something that is going on inside, hinting at the possibility that hyperprolemia was manifesting itself in the delay in eating. She also had a girl tested at a service center focusing on developmental disabilities, and she was diagnosed as being a month behind in her motor development and qualified for physical and occupational therapy, again, because of this diagnosis of hyperprolemia. And then the, the same diagnosis had also consequences in the adoption process. So social service had intervened in this family for a whole bunch of factors, but one of the reasons that the judge had assigned the kids to the foster mama um, was that the, the, the birth parents had not followed up for the positive newborn screen. So in order to show that the foster mother, that she was qualified, she took these visits very seriously and she uh, made sure that um, um, she documented everything, um, that she took hyperprolemia seriously. So these actions, they prove, they, they create some kind of social relevancy in the lives of these families, even though it's not um, really clear that, again, that these diseases are um, present in these children. So how does this situation end? So this can go on for months, even a year, um, and there's not really a conclusive end point. In the end, it sort of fades away. There's just no more testing that can be done. And in that meantime, the child often developed more or less normally or within the normal parameters. And so the geneticist at this point is quite confident to downgrade the condition and say, um, you know, we might want to relax our, our, our medical surveillance here. But the geneticist never really tells the family, you're out of the clear, you're, you have a clean bill of health. Like one of the things we heard in one of these um, situations is where the geneticist says, your child is not sick, but he's not normal. And as a parent, that's probably the ultimate, ultimate contradictory message you can get um, told of by, by a physician. And so, to our surprise, parents were quite reluctant to give up all these steps that they had taken to keep their, their child under medical supervision because they thought their child was doing well because of all these preventive steps that they had put into place. And because there wasn't really a an, an preset endpoint where the child would be in the clear, they were very reluctant to just let go of these steps. So what we saw was a very different, interesting discrepancy where the clinician was ready to, to um, let go of the diagnosis, but the families were 
quite reluctant and held on to um, these preventive measures. And there were some exceptions, some uh, Spanish families who, who had to deal with one particular geneticist who, didn't, who wasn't able to speak Spanish very well and I would think he didn't communicate it very um, um, eloquently. And there was one family who was suspicious of that their child was being experimented on, but that was the only family. And in total, uh, there were about 42 families who were sort of kept in this limbo state between health and disease. Okay, so my first take-home point here is that there's this new population created through newborn screening of people who are kept in limbo, sort of between health and, dis and disease, that we call them patients in waiting, because they take on the role as patients even though they're not really patients yet, they're still in waiting. Okay, so then the second element that I want to highlight, and I'll do this uh, a little shorter, is the fact that um, no, expansion of newborn screening also has changed our understanding of these conditions for which we were um, screening. Um, and the reason for this is that population screening, what it aims for, and that's its intended purpose, it aims to find people who are asymptomatic so that you can intervene and avoid the onset of symptoms. That's the idea of, of prevention behind it. But what happens is that the diseases that you thought you were screening for actually become different entities after a couple of years of exper experience with screening. And I will illustrate this with this condition called MCAT, which stands for medium chain acyl uh, carnitine. Um, let me just quickly read the, 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 uh, the right name. This is where sociologists aren't always as good at. So medium chain acyl COA dehydrogenase deficiency. That's what it stands for. It's not a test you take to go into medical school. Um, so this was discovered in 1982. And um, the key idea behind this condition is that um, you lack an enzyme that is needed to process stored fat into energy. And the, the, um, the importance of this is that if these kids get fed at a regular interval, they're fine. But if they get a medical episode where they, can, where they cannot keep in food, they're throwing up, for example, for a long period of time, they, this can be fatal to them. So this is why, this is what I mentioned before, first sign of MCAT is often um, a sudden um, death. And this condition, when it was discovered in 1982, was associated with a um, population of northern European descent. Um, it had a particular kind of uh, low um, incidence. And prior to no newborn screening, you would only find these patients when they develop symptoms because you were, there was no other reason to go and look for them. And so what happened when these patients for, developed symptoms, you, if they were lucky and they went to an emergency department where they did the blood test that could look for um, these, these metabolic uh, enzyme levels, um, then the biochemical test would confirm what was going on and that often was sufficient to figure out a diagnosis. Once in a while you also um, did genetic testing um, and that didn't necessarily have any therapeutic value but it was more to sort of figure out what kind of condition we're dealing with and almost all kids, more than 90% had two main genetic variants that explained MCAT. So we had you, you, to really get to just summarize, you went from symptoms to biochemical values and that was sufficient and then genetic testing was sort of secondary. So now what happens when you screen an entire population? You find many more infants than you thought should be found based on the incidence figures that you thought existed for this um, condition. And you do that because you don't start with symptoms. You start with, with a biochemical uh, range and you find kids um, out of um, range, but they, they don't have symptoms yet, so you cannot go and confirm your biochemical levels with the symptoms. Instead, you have to go back to the genetic variants, and you have to see whether these infants have the two known genetic variants. And what the researchers found, or what the geneticists found who were doing this, they found many more genetic mutations that they had never seen before um, in the past associated with MCAT. And here's a geneticist explaining this to a family. She says that newborn screening has opened up a whole new era of research on the molecular basis of this condition because now the original test just measures the fats, right? 
So now we are finding that we cannot sometimes just diagnose the condition just based on that. She's talking to the metabolic level here. So we have to go to, do the, to, go to the DNA test, which is what we did in your case. And when we do that, we find all sorts of new mutations that have never been seen before because the cases are probably milder and so we never saw them before. So it's possible that there are people in this room walking around with this MCAT condition, but it's never been an issue or with this, um, and you would never even develop this um, kind of um, um, symptoms. So what uh, population screening does then, it shows you that what you thought was one condition might actually be two conditions, a milder version for which um, interventions might not be necessary and a more serious version. And you also find out that the population basis that you thought was associ associated with um, this condition, like with MCAT, that you thought they were mostly under no people from Northern European descent, actually there is an Asian variant of MCAT, or there might be um, entire new populations associated um, with Aaron, so with, with MCAT. So the incidence, the severity, the populations, they all change. Our understanding of the disease changes because we're now screening a full population. And so what's happening in the field right now is that for each of these conditions that is being screened, some of these conditions are being redefined. So like hyperprolinemia is considered to be no disease at all after all. So this, there's a move away for screening for hyperprolinemia. Other ones split up into a milder variant and a more serious variant. Um, and other ones um, become um, uh, uh, much more, more um, serious than they used to be in the past. So we have a rethinking, it's like a rearranging of these diseases due to the screening program. And this happens all the time, but the screening program is really just putting this on steroids. So diseases are not really clearly defined entities, but they themselves change because of the screening program. Okay. So then the third question that I want to come to is um, the bottom line question. It's like, does newborn screening save lives? And to really answer this question, you need a very different kind of research design than the one I give you. Uh, you need probably something with a control group or you need some kind of, um, and, and some kind of randomization of a population you, and, and you need to um, uh, look at, uh, looking at the statistical differences between the different groups to see whether it really makes an impact on, uh, for example, infant mortality. And that is not what my study is good for because we looked at one clinic in one out of seven, even in the state of California, and we did it only for a three-year period. But in our study, we can find some clues that can give us an idea of the conditions under which newborn screening may be able to save lives. So I want to stick to what I can tell you with some authority about, and these are these clues, and there are three clues that I want to convey to us. First of all is that for different diseases, it's just a very different kind of opportunity to intervene. So some of these conditions, there actually is no treatment available. So because of the screening program, you just will know that's, that your child might die at a very young age. And this could be good news or this could be uh, bad news depending on, on where you stand on this. Um, but every this, this condition has a different opportunity to intervene. And MCAT was actually the poster child for the expansion of newborn screening. So this is the best case um, scenario that, that you could, just like PKU was for the very early um, screening program. So the first point is there's just a biological factor. Different diseases give you different opportunities for intervening. And then the second point is that the window of opportunity depends on a lot of invisible work that just doesn't come to the foreground if you just say a phrase like, does newborn screening save lives? And the point here is that newborn screening can give an opportunity for saving lives, but only if a lot of other elements fall into place. And um, this came, became very clear to us in the case of a, um, a young girl who was um, identified, she was actually one of the oldest patients in our, in our study, she was identified in Australia with MCAT. And she was not one of these patients that I was talking about before, uh, a patient in waiting, she was somebody where it was crystal clear that she was an affected child. She had, the genetic testing was done and she had one of these um, um, classic variants for MCAT. So there was very little ambiguity that she actually had the disease. And so at some point during our study, this, this girl um, contracts the swine flu. And so she gets very sick and the flu is very bad for um, this, this child because she cannot hold up any uh, fluids and she cannot hold up any food. And so 
um, she very quickly decompensates and her mother rushes her to the emergency department and she calls her pediatrician in advance and the pediatrician goes to the emergency department, talks to the doctors and before they even arrive there, everyone is ready and they insert um, glucose in her and she stabilizes. And it was a very scary event for this mom and she's explaining this in the clinic where we're doing obs observations to the geneticist and he sort of poo-poos her story. He says, well, the most important thing is when they get sick, get them to a hospital and make sure that they're eating. If they eat, they're protected. Although people talk about low-fat diets, talk about carnitine, the essential treatment is just not letting them become ill. With this condition, it's easy to treat. So that unless you live in the middle of nowhere, and here the mother interrupts him, and she's just livid. She screams at him. She says, or getting to the emergency room, or have a doctor that will take you seriously, or have a rapid onset disorder. You make it sound like it's so easy. Like all you do is get them to the ER. So much happens before they get sick and before you get to the IV drip. And what this mother draws attention to is that indeed it's not newborn screening that saves lives. It's newborn screening gives an opportunity for saving lives in the best of circumstances, but then you need somebody to monitor the child to take the appropriate steps to have a healthcare system that collaborates, to have health insurance that, that um, um, accepts you. And only if all those other elements, these invisible elements that depend to a large extent on, to the, on the work of relatives, only if those fell into, fall into place, then newborn screening saves lives. But it's, there's a lot of invisible work that is being delegated to relatives that is unacknowledged and that is sort of glossed over with the phrase newborn screening saves lives. But I don't want to give you the impression that it's all on the, sh rests on the shoulders of the moms to um, save lives because there's a third element that really impacts to a large extent whether or not newborn screening saves lives. And this is the typical story of the US healthcare system. It's the inequities in the health infrastructure. Remember that at the beginning of my talk I mentioned that newborn screening is a quasi-universal um, program, in a screening program that screens more than 99% of all infants born in the United States. And how exceptional this was in the current healthcare um, situation. Well, the screening is universal, but the follow-up is delegated to the healthcare system and all the other factors that we know mediate people's access and the quality of care that they receive in, in healthcare are going to play their role and systematically erode some of these advantages that a public health screening program brings up. So we saw this in the case of insurance differences where some people who had private insurance because these are some rare, such rare disease, diseases, the, the health directors in these private in these HMOs and other uh, private insurance companies didn't really know how to deal with these conditions and there was a long delay before they um, allowed for follow-up tests, etc. Uh, we saw this in the case of medical food. So many, because these are metabolic conditions, you often have to change the diet and so you need specialized foods for, food for these um, kids. But food are not like regulated like pharmaceuticals, they're more regulated like vitamins. So many health insurance companies just don't pay for it and for some families this could become a burden in terms of accessing um, um, the care they needed for their child once we got through this critical um, early period. We also saw this in access to therapeutic services. In California there's a lot of pretty good services available for a child until the age of three, but then after the age of three the child is get sort of handed over to the school system um, and there's issues with authorization. It becomes very much more difficult to qualify for services and kids age out of that system. And so a lot of the progress they make in the early years doesn't get sustained in once they make the transition to after year, year three. But it was also something we saw in very basic situations, like in some of the families that we studied, they didn't have transportation to go to the clinic. The clinic only met on a Monday afternoon. So people had to take time off from work, take their kids out of school. And you know, we have this story of a family that took like four or five hours to make it to the clinic and then they could only be there an hour because they had to go back up um, and go to the same in reverse, going four or five hours back to, with public transportation home. And so they basically dropped out of, of follow-up because it was just too, too cumbersome for them to get there. Um, language could be a barrier as I mentioned to you before.
So in conclusion, what are some of these consequences of, of a genetic screening? And I want to say that what I'm focusing on is what is interesting from a sociological perspective. So as I gave you in the example of the MCAT patients where newborn screening did make a difference, there is a place where it does make an enormous life-changing difference. But I'm focusing on some of these unexpected but still very important um, consequences. And they're important in just of rounding out what this program is really about. So I've talked about the introduction of a new patient populations, these patients in waiting who are picked up by the screening, but they're not really clear whether they're diseased or whether they're healthy. And um, there's some concern that, um, you know, that they might develop symptoms so they're kept under close medical supervision. I'm also talked about how our understanding of these diseases has shifted dramatically through um, the screening programs. And then I've showed how the, um, the promise of saving babies through newborn screening gets somewhat eroded by the um, access issues and the inequities um, uh, prevalent in the, in, the, in the US healthcare system. So what you see, what we see in our study is how families and clinicians try to make sense of this program, how they try to work out the kinks, and they're doing this with um, very limited information um, and trying to do the best they can to the situation, but it sort of, it creates a new form of social differentiation. And some of it is very traditional, like a lot of the care is delegated to moms, for example. This is one of the most consistent findings of social science research of this, this particular kind. But there's also new forms where people are um, differentiated based on um, the kind of condition they have, the kind of time that they're being seen by a, um, a geneticist that will um, uh, characterize their, their experience. And it's not just an element of genetization, it's like this genetization that is socially embedded and made socially, uh, rendered socially meaningful. And so why do we care? Because we care a lot about when people get a diagnosis, because diagnoses are really important for um, a variety of reasons, like we organize health policies around diagnosis, we also uh, organize patient trajectories, the life of clinics, the functionality of clinics around diagnosis. We even differentiate legitimate and illegitimate diagnoses when we have like um, issues of work. And so what I showed in this study today is how the functionality of diagnosis is now also being extended to the pa patients who aren't really yet um, patients. So thank you very much. My question is about those babies who are found to be absolutely positive and they do have one of these conditions. Mm -hmm. Are there any thoughts in the United States or in Canada or elsewhere to then call back the siblings of those babies for further testing? Because you know, the assumption would be that since this child has these <coughs> genetics, then perhaps their siblings can also share some of those genetic uh, properties yeah. that may be subject to these things? That is exactly what's happening. And that's actually why we also know that when we did the initial PKU screening in the 1960s, so when they tested the siblings, they also found out that there were um, children with PKU who were more or less developing normally, although they had the, val the PQ value values that were out of range. And so what it shows also is that there is that these genetic markers for these conditions are not necessarily completely predictive of whether we will whether you will develop this condition or not so even this the strong information so this actually is done and i have seen in the clinic how um the uh the geneticist would would ask about other siblings and so what they don't want to do is they want to do go on the wild goose chase and just test these, these um, infants or the, the siblings without a reason. But if there's a, even the slightest inclination that there might be some symptoms present there, then they're, they're also going to offer genetic testing as a way of honing in on a diagnosis. So exactly that's happening. There's a question in the back. Okay. Yeah, this is fascinating and I, I wonder what your next study will be because the next step, um, perhaps logically, is we now have all of this 
We have the ability to look at a whole host of potential genetic uh, diseases. And, and the added dimension to that is then you have the ability in certain countries to then decide not to carry on with your pregnancy. And I mean, I think that is maybe a logical next step, and I don't know if you're going to do that or... So there are two logical next steps in this, this kind of project, or this kind of enterprise, not my project, but in this, the way that we have organized newborn screening. So one of the next steps is indeed what you have said, that whatever we can do postnatally, we probably can also do prenatally. And now with non-invasive prenatal testing, where you can just take uh, blood of the mom and do a, a genetic profile of the fetus, there's a lot that, it, that can be done prenatally, but then you get in a very different kind of social, social kind of calculus about, um, you know, uh, pregnancy versus abortion, etc. And so th this might not get as much support as it, as, uh, especially not in the United States. Um, but there's actually another pathway here, and the National Institute of Health is um, investing in five pilot studies where instead of using tandem mass spectrometry, which can look at all these metabolites, they're now looking for ways whether it makes sense to do um, whole exome sequencing right at the beginning um, as part of newborn screening. So basically whole exome sequencing or maybe and in the future whole genome sequencing will be looking at all the um, uh, protein coding areas of the genome. Um, which basically is presumed to, um, in, to, to be involved in 85% of the um, disease-causing um, variants. So instead of doing just looking at a handful of conditions, you could basically screen an entire um, genome for the disease-causing um, conditions. And, and there, is, there are, so like I said, there are five sites in the US currently studying the feasibility of this. So we can also build on this infrastructure that has been in place since 1963 to make this a full-fledged um, genetic technology. And again, this would change the calculus very differently because you're dealing here with um, asymptomatic situations and you're going to have to read, you know, predictability into um, genetic um, markers and it's going to be, I mean, if that happens, then everyone who is born will be a patient in waiting. Everyone will be um, um, having like 200 kind of conditions that you have to be on the lookout for throughout your entire life course. So that is, that is another way in which this can, can be um, built. And we already have the infrastructure more or less into place. So this, this could be um, the next step that, in a, you know, if in 10 years, the person who's talking here about this program could, could give you a very um, different kind of talk about the scope of this kind of um, testing. So, so the sky is the limit. There's, there's many different ways in which this can go. And just to sort of offer you a little bit about the counter side, because we've been talking here mostly about the medical value of this testing. So there is some resistance in the US against this testing, and it's not on medical grounds, it's on privacy grounds. So there is concern that the government has a blood sample of every newborn and can use that because these blood samples are not destroyed, so can use this and keep them at, uh, for, for a very long time period. And so there are some libertarian groups, particularly in Minnesota, have been, and, and in Texas as well, uh, um, who have been fighting the um, the, the, the newborn screening programs out of um, privacy concerns, and that's the most resistance. So it's not people like me who are um, necessarily on, on the, I mean, and I hope I made it very clear to you that I'm not against newborn screening. I'm just trying to paint you a little broader picture. But the, the people who are against newborn screening are people who are concerned about privacy issues. Thank you. I appreciate the talk, actually, um, because uh, I, I actually am a pediatrician, mm -hmm. and I've worked both in the U.S. and I'm working here as well. Uh, and part of the, um, when I was in the States, uh, the newborn screening program was very systemized and very effective, actually, in picking up rare diseases uh, that have a, uh, some sort of treatment plan for that patient when picked up early and, and allows for prevention and lead time in treatment. Um, over here in the UAE, we have a very irregular, in, in fact, not very systemized practice of newborn screening. Uh, there are some hospitals that do it and some hospitals that don't. And the communication between patient and the lab that does the study is often not there. So we often get um, either no patient, 
coming in late or uh, delay in diagnosis, and often we get the, the, the late effects of that, of that condition on the patient, uh, and often it's misdiagnosed as well. So my question is, prevention really is the best cure, <coughs> and a lot of these newborn screenings, if done properly, allow for effective treatment. Um, in medicine, often there is often a social effect of any kind of diagnosis, whether it be chronic or whether it be congenital. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand what, what you're bringing into, the, into question, uh, the effect of any kind of diagnosis, but I, I see that in commonly, uh, whether it was picked up earlier or whether it was not picked up. Uh, so in either case, you see the effect the same way. If you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you, what your, your, your question sort of goes to the heart of this talk. So it would be completely wrong, and that's, I've tried to avoid that impression that I'm against newborn screening. I think it is, it is a really important program. And there was a moment in US history prior to 2005 that it could have gone very differently, that it could have been taken out of the hands of a public health mandate and be thrown into private companies. There are actually some states that were going into, this different, uh, into that direction. And having a public health program is definitely, um, because these are such rare disease conditions, it's definitely a much better kind of um, situation than having a, uh, a program that just depends on whether parents are willing to pay for it or not, um, because you're going to miss so much of these, of, of these um, um, kids otherwise. And it only is going to be effective if you indeed screen um, the, 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 the full population. Um, now, in terms of how, I, I mean, I don't really know that much about what happens here. I know that what happens for, so the argument that was made prior to the expansion of newborn screening is that for the families who, who, who's, for, who had a child whose condition was not part of newborn screening and then became later part of it, the argument that they made was that they, the, the parent was put on and the, and the baby was put on this diagnostic odyssey where it would go from specialist to specialist and often it would take a long time before it was correctly diagnosed and often in that there was a critical time period that was lost before they um, 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 got to see the specialist. And so the idea behind expanded newborn screening is that you avoid this diagnostic odyssey. What I talk about is that you're actually also throwing another group of people on a different kind of diagnostic odyssey. Now, if you are a, if you are a parent of a child who, who, who is affected, who truly has these kind of conditions. You look at the people that I'm talking about and you say, I wish my child was like that. I wish that I had a child that, um, had to go through some, that I had to go through some anxiety for a period of time and then had to go, uh, and then I, that I was, um, um, you know, absolved or maybe even there was some lingering uncertainties. I can live with that, but now I have a child that is affected. So, so it's very difficult to evaluate both parts of, the, of the, um, the equation. I think what the merit is of this kind of a study is that it adds another layer to the discussion and shows you that there are other consequences besides the key goal of the intervention that you laid out so nicely, which is indeed um, prevention, and that the, that the picture is much more varied and more, more complicated. But it doesn't, so if I was a policymaker and I would listen to my own study, I would still be, still be in favor for um, um, expansion of newborn screening. I would think, I would start thinking carefully about the informed consent issue maybe. I would also think carefully about the kind of communication patterns. I would also think carefully about, you know, all these parents are going through this experience. Are we following these, these are we using the data to the best um, use possible so that we make it less likely that pe patients are thrown in this patient in waiting kind of trajectory. So there are other things you can do without having to do newborn screening or non-newborn screening. I think there are ways that you can improve newborn screening, taking the results of that I have laid out to you and incorporating them into um, an uh, improved newborn screening program. Would the insurance companies uh, have something to say about pre-existing conditions on this topic? So about pre-existing conditions? Um, that's a very, very good question. I, that hasn't come up in any of the research that I have read about this, this um, uh, program. Um, you know, most of the, of the there, there is health insurance, of course, for, for most of the, in, for almost all of the infants in the US. 
um, through various uh, programs that fill in gaps? So it's a very good question. I mean, I haven't, I haven't really encountered that as a point of activism or a point of resistance. And there's, of course, also concern about genetic discrimination, but, you know, this is part of the medical record. So this, this, there's, a, there's a way that this could haunt people later on. Um, and, and, you know, it's a bit of a double-edged sword whether this is going to be beneficial to have or whether this is going to be counter. Because it could be indeed very negative as a pre-existing condition. So I, it's a really good question. I haven't really looked into that. I'm going to look into it. Thank you. And that's where informed consent would really become much more important. Huh? Yeah.